Hello, I'm taking on a challenge to beat every playable Nintendo published game. Welcome to the next episode. The next game is Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels. The story of this one is pretty well known at this point, but in case you haven't heard about it yet, this one was the original Super Mario Bros. 2 in Japan and it initially never released in the US. This was because the developers decided to make the game much more difficult than the original, and it 10 of America thought that the game was too difficult and not very fun as a result. They were concerned that the game would not be received well in America, and instead, they adapted a completely different Nintendo game from Japan into what they would call Super Mario Bros. 2 in the US. We'll hear more about that game in the future. However, I mostly just want to focus on the Lost Levels in this video. So, where does the name The Lost Levels come from then? Fast forward seven years later, and Nintendo released a collection of the NES Super Mario games on the Super Nintendo called Super Mario All-Stars. This collection included both the Japanese version and the US version of Super Mario Bros. 2, so in the West they officially dubbed the Japanese version Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels for the collection. The SNES version of the game did receive some updates though, and it wasn't until 2007 that the original version of the game would finally become available to Western audiences on the Wii Virtual Console. Since then, it has been a standard part of Nintendo's retro offerings to the West, and it has continued to use the name Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels. While I personally have played both the All-Stars version and the Wii Virtual Console version, I've never actually finished all the bonus levels in the game's original format, so this will be my first time going for all levels in the original game. Alright, so, what was the development of the Lost Levels like? While Miyamoto was still involved, this was apparently Tezuka's first time being the lead designer of a game, although he had worked as an assistant director for the original Super Mario Bros. Inspiration for the game's difficulty arose from their time making the newer difficult levels in the Versus System version of Super Mario Bros., and those levels ended up even being reused in this version. Since Japan never saw Versus Super Mario Bros., these levels were actually completely new for them. The game ended up being released in less than a year after the original. While I don't find it to be anything too egregious, this one is definitely not as new feeling as the original. As I said before, they reused some previous stages, and the graphics and physics were largely the same as the original, with a few minor tweaks here and there. When you compare how different all three Super Mario Bros. games were on the NES in the West, this game feels more like an extension or a hard DLC pack of the original, which in a way makes the Lost Levels title actually feel pretty fitting. Fully aware that this wasn't a fitting title for beginners, they even put four super players on the case, and I even found an advertisement for the game that had a child raging at its difficulty. The game launched exclusively on the Famicom Disk System in Japan, and despite its difficulty, the game still sold pretty well. It sold over 2.6 million copies in Japan alone, and although it never ended up selling as much as the other Super Mario Bros. titles, it was the best-selling Famicom Disk System exclusive. I imagine the game not selling as much as the other Super Mario Bros. titles was due in large part to it never having an international release. The game was also never bundled with the system, which probably affected this too. So, is this game as hard as they say? Let's find out. One thing interesting about this game is that you can choose to play as either Mario or Luigi, and they actually play pretty differently too. Luigi jumps higher, but he is also way more slippery. I see people often debate which one makes the game easier. Mario is so much easier to control, but Luigi's extra jump height can make certain levels so much easier than they are with Mario. Personally, I kind of think it's situational, with certain levels feeling easier with one over the other. In the past, I've usually played as Luigi for that extra jump height, so that's what I did here too. It also helps the game to feel a bit more different than the original anyway. Don't worry, I did play through the entire game eventually as Mario 2, for reasons I'll share later on. One of the first things we can see in 1-1 is that they've added faces to everything. The clouds have faces, the trees have faces, and even the mushroom power-ups have faces. Pretty quickly, we see a devious item here too, the poison mushroom. It looks kind of similar to a normal mushroom, but I already knew this thing hurts you, so I avoided it. This level isn't really all that bad, but it's definitely harder than the first level in the original. In some ways, this first world sort of mirrors the first world in the original. The first level is a standard level, the second is an underground level, the third is a sky level, and of course, the final level is a castle level. Obviously, the levels themselves are different though, and the difficulty is definitely a bit higher than the first world in the original. I did pretty good for most of the world, although I did lose my first life in 1-4 due to the Ouija slipperiness. Deaths like this honestly aren't too uncommon when you play as Luigi. Of course, you can also use your slipperiness to pull off epic maneuvers like this. Woohoo! It was close, but I touched the axe and beat World 1 with only one life lost. World 2 was kind of similar in that the levels were definitely more tough than the original World 2, but I was able to get through it relatively unscathed. 
I actually kind of like the difficulty at this point. There were more platforming challenges that I found fun than in the original, and there's nothing yet I found to be all that unfair. I got through the world without losing a life, although I was once again small Luigi at the end. Thanks to Luigi's super jumps, I was able to pull off this maneuver and get a mushroom while getting over a pit in 3-1. The rest of the world still manages to ride that sweet spot for me, and I got through it once again without losing any lives. This world had the first water level, and in the castle we can see the return of those nasty maze castles from the original. They've made it even more brutal here, requiring you to use some invisible blocks to make it through the correct path. I still may not have had a fire flower for Bowser again, but this time I beat the world while being Super Luigi. World 4 had the first of these nasty spring jumps that require you to press the jump button with the correct timing to make the jump. These can be pretty rough, since the timing isn't exactly easy, and you basically have to commit before you know whether or not you've timed it right. Thankfully, I got it here on my first try. In 4-2, I was pretty dumb and tried way too hard to fit into a tiny space, and I ended up losing a life to a bullet bill. 4-3 was the return of that awful level from vs. Super Mario Bros. that was full of blind jumps. Thankfully, Luigi shines here, making it much easier than the arcade version. I beat this level on my first try this time. Unfortunately, my momentum was crushed by 4-4. Luigi's slipperiness made this one really tough, and the level is full of jumps that you need to make into tight spots. I lost all my lives here and had to reset the world. Similar to Super Mario Bros, you reset at the beginning of each world, but thankfully you don't need to enter an obscure code this time to do it. Somehow, my second run through the world went way worse. I lost to a spiny thrown by a Lakitu, I failed that spring jump, and I had one of the most embarrassing deaths of them all. There is a single hole before the flag in 4-1, and somehow I plopped right into it. After losing a life to a hammer bro in 4-2, I thankfully smoked 4-3 once again. How is it that the hardest level in Versus Super Mario Bros is the easiest one for me here? Anyway, I was back at 4-4, but this time with only one life. Yikes. I did make it further this time, although I almost died to this hidden block near the end. Man, this game is kind of trolling. Unfortunately, I failed one of the last jumps in the level, and it was back to the beginning of World 4 once again. Alright, come on. My gamer cred is on the line here. I know I can do better than this. On the next run, I smoked levels 1 through 3, making it to the castle with the fire flower and all my lives remaining. Nice, I'm in the zone. The death zone, that is, as I died again and again to this one and got another game over. <sighs> Back to the start of World 4 for me. After losing a life to the Lakitu again, I decided it wasn't worth keeping runs alive that died this early, so I got another intentional game over here. I game over this way a couple more times even, as I kept failing that spring jump over the water. Man, the next run was so close. I even got to Bowser, but I ended up sliding right into his face. Honestly, it doesn't even look like I touched him here. This one made me pretty mad. WHAT WAS THAT HITBOX?! Finally, on the next run, I made it though. Sheesh, what a drastic jump in difficulty. And it was mostly just due to that last castle too. World 5 ended up being pretty tough too. 5-1 is kind of a weird level. It introduces wind, which messes up with your physics. And there's this weird section with a wall at the end where you need to find hidden blocks to climb up. 5-2 was an underground level that I didn't find too bad, and 5-3 was a strange looping level where the stage repeats until you find a hidden path in one of the pipes. The stage doesn't end after the pipe either, and I got another game over in this final section of the level. The platforming in this second half of the level is just so tough. I got another game over here too on the next run. I eventually made it to the castle, but this one was pretty difficult too. My first time here, I got tricked by Bowser's fire and jumped straight into my death. In the end, World 5 ended up taking me about as long as World 4, although this was due in part to how much harder the rest of the levels were and not just the castle. When I did get to the castle again, I finally beat it, although man, it was close. I actually didn't find World 6 quite as bad as the past two at least, but I did get scorched by Bowser Fire again in the castle, getting a game over when I was so close. 6-4 is another tricky maze castle, but I managed to beat it on my next attempt afterwards. I ended up beating World 7 even faster than the previous world, although I probably shouldn't have. Level 7-3 is an infamous level where you have to use super springs to make it through a windy section. The worst part about this section though is that you are above the screen and you have to line yourself up onto some pretty small platforms, which is not easy. There's also a tough platforming section near the end too. While I think my skills built up for my previous playthroughs of the game helped here, it still was not free. I got a game over on this level, and 7-2 was also pretty hard, causing me to get a second game over there too. I eventually did beat 7-3 though, but I still had to get through the castle. I used my amazing platforming skills to pull off this incredible maneuver somehow. I think some sort of bug happens if you fall onto one of the platforms the moment it flips back to the top. The level wasn't easy, but somehow I got it on my first try. Getting through Bowser was super close though, and practically gave me a heart attack. Whoa! <laughs> I did it! <laughs> Woo!
Phew, on to the final world. Despite getting through those last two worlds relatively quickly, this last one is a doozy. 8-1 is full of hammer bros, including some that are very aggressive. Ah, oh, as I say, it's the invisible block. Dude, he's so aggressive, back off! There are quite a few power-ups on this stage, but because of all the hammer bros, I often didn't make it through with a fire flower. 8-2 isn't easy either, and it's especially bad when it's your first time playing. Similar to some of the earlier levels, this one actually loops infinitely, and you have to find a secret way out. This time though, it's hidden in a pretty devious spot. There's a block with a vine in it, and to hit it, you have to bounce off of a Koopa over a pit. To make matters worse, there's a star right before this part, which you can't use since it prevents you from bouncing on the Koopa. Pretty nasty. While I still lost a handful of lives to this jump, the real nasty part of this level for me was this awful spring jump in the middle of it. Not only is this once again a spring jump you have to commit to, but you also have to land on a single block tower safely too. I lost a ton of lives here throughout my runs. I actually found out later on that if you jump onto the spring while running, you can make it all the way over to the other side, but unfortunately I didn't figure this out until quite a bit later. 8-3 ended up being even more brutal. This level is full of hammer bros, and there's tons of hidden blocks throughout the walls that can really mess your jumps up. There's another nasty spring jump here too, and this time you've got to bounce off some Koopas at the end. Thankfully, I found out pretty early on that running and jumping on it while holding right was a pretty consistent way to make things line up well. Once again though, I lost quite a bit of lives to this one. However, the worst level here is definitely the final level, 8-4. It even starts you off with a pretty nasty jump. You either gain enough speed on this tiny staircase, or make this sketchy jump down to the left first. This castle is another castle with looping sections where you have to go the exact right way to make it forward. One of the worst parts of this level though is this nasty jump that you have to angle just right. There's a piranha plant here too, so you have to time it right as well. It's super easy to just mess up the angle here and fall to your doom. Apparently this jump is easier as Mario than as Luigi. Anyway, I lost so many runs here. In general, I struggled quite a bit with this world. At this point, I was really starting to feel burnt out by only having 3 lives. I don't mind having to start over each world on a game over, but I can't help but feel like 5 lives would have given me enough attempts to actually make good progress on each run. Eventually, I finally got past that jump, but I got hit by the piranha plant and was small again. After running down a hallway for a while, I completely failed the jump and went straight into a Koopa. Ugh, back to the start of World 8. The next time I got back here, I made it through with a mushroom this time, and I even did good enough to reach the end with a fire flower. After a bit more, I found... Blue Bowser? But he's not on a bridge. Yep, this stage just throws a Bowser at you before the real final Bowser for some reason. This one doesn't even turn into a generic enemy when you defeat him, so I guess this is actually Bowser? Maybe it's his long lost brother or something. Looking further into this, there are a few places where this character is referred to as Bowser's brother, but Nintendo hasn't exactly been consistent about it. Anyway, I ended up making it to the final battle with a fire flower, which meant I had this in the bag. I was a bit short on time, so I didn't want to take any risks. I damage boosted my way through Bowser and beat the game. After rescuing Peach, who has an entirely new sprite this time around, she recites the poem from Versus Super Mario Bros. However, she replaces the word Mario with Luigi this time around, which rhymes with hero even worse than Mario does. With that, Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels was complete. <sighs> if only that were true. Before I get into the real disaster that is the secret worlds A through D, let's first take a look at the bonus world, World 9. You only get access to this world if you go through the entire game without warps, which I did, so I was given access to it. However, they only give you one life to beat it. They call it the Fantasy World, and it's pretty bizarre. Apparently, it's directly inspired by the glitch worlds in the original Super Mario Bros, like World Minus One. While the Minus World is the most famous, there's actually tons of different levels you can access using glitches and exploits. In the FDS version of the original game, the glitched level 9-1 in particular was an underwater overworld level, which is what inspired World 9 in this game. While I don't really think I would call this bonus world a requirement to beat the game, I did want to see if I could do it. One of my moderators assured me it was easy and there was no way I would lose that one life. However, I plopped a save state down just in case I wanted to practice it for future runs if I did end up failing. The first level in Rule 9 is one of those water levels that is sort of a weird mix of a standard level and a water level. In addition to some standard water enemies, there's tons of normal enemies here too, including Lakitu's and Hammer Bros. Thankfully, you could swim over most of it, but I did have a close call with some bloopers. Phew. 9-1 complete. 9-2 was another weird overworld water level hybrid, except this time there was a roof so you couldn't just fly over everything. There's another Lakitu here, but thankfully if you swim fast enough his spinies can't hit you. Or at least they shouldn't be able to hit you. He threw one right into a pipe, which made it suddenly walk to the right and change trajectory, and he fell right onto me. That's right, I failed world 9. 
At this point, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to play the whole game again without warps, but just in case, I decided to go through World 9 with save states to make sure I was ready for it in a real run. I want to be clear here. While I do still consider this game beaten since I saw the standard ending, I do not consider using save states here to be beating World 9. So, with the usage of save states, I got to see the rest of World 9 here. The rest of 9-2 is pretty easy, and 9-3 is a weird one. This one is an overworld castle hybrid, and honestly, this level just looks unfinished. Like, what is going on with these pipes and walls here? I guess this is the fantasy world, after all. There's a blue Bowser randomly here too who walks through the walls. Thankfully, you can sneak above him if you want to. The final level is a water level too, and there are blocks that spell out thank you in Japanese. There are still a ton of enemies here, and while most of it isn't too bad, there is a blooper that can be pretty tricky to get through. Man, part of me really wanted to do this world legit, but doing the whole game warpless again did not sound fun, especially after what was coming next. You see, when you beat the game, a little star appears on the title screen. Once you've amassed 8 total stars, you get access to 4 bonus worlds, worlds A through D. Yep, you heard that right, I had to beat the game 7 more times to see all the levels. Honestly, I have no idea why they did this. They probably wanted the levels to feel super special to unlock or something, but making you play a hard game like this 8 times over is kind of just ridiculous. Thankfully, I could use warps from here on out, which is why despite playing the game 7 more times, I didn't really want to go for World 9 again. Of course, I could have just said it was good enough here for the sake of the challenge, but I knew I wanted to see all four of those bonus worlds. And so, my journey to beating Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels seven more times began. Of course, I don't really want to bore you all with the details of beating this game seven times over, so I'll just talk about what my new route with the warps looked like. Once again, the first warp is in level 1-2 after going over the ending pipe, although this time they give you a secret section of the level with some extra challenges, including a section with a seemingly dead end with secret blocks to climb. This warp takes you to world 4. Unfortunately, the next warp is in world 5, so I had to beat world 4 every time, and this was one of the worlds I struggled with during my first playthrough. I eventually did get pretty good at it though, and the next warp was in 5-2. Once again, this one is in an underground level, and this time you have to jump and hit a block just over the edge to find a hidden vine. Thankfully, this one takes you all the way to world 8, so after this, it's just the final world. Something I didn't really show off at all here, is that there are actually secret warps in this game that will take you back to previous worlds. I knew these were in the game though, so I completely avoided them. Even with all of these warps, world 8 was still the hardest world, so this did not go quickly. Finally though, after 6 hours of playing this game, I had beaten it 8 times and earned all 8 stars. Will these new bonus levels be worth it? Probably not. First up is World A. Levels 1 and 2 here are pretty standard. There's some tricky platforming, but nothing I couldn't handle. A3 was pretty nasty though. Not only was it a sky level with jumping fish, but there were bloopers flying freely in the air too. Great. The castle is pretty tricky too, although I managed to make it to Bowser with one life remaining. Come on, I can do this. Unfortunately, I panicked to jump into a fireball and had to do it all again. Thankfully, I got past him on the next run though. Level B1 was pretty standard, and B2 was a relatively normal water level, although it did have this random massive fire bar at the end. B3 had a lot of tricky platforming, although I was able to use some springs to skip a lot of it. There were some blind jumps at the end, and humorously, I prepped for a big jump when the flag was right there. B4 wasn't too bad, although it had this section where I had to duck as large Luigi. I managed to get through the whole level on my first try, which meant I beat World B without even losing a single life. Nice. World C is where things started to get rough, and that's mostly just because of one level alone. While C1 and C2 weren't exactly easy, they were nothing compared to C3. This level is basically just a repeat of 7-3, that awful spring level with the wind. However, this time they've done something even worse. They've added a Lakitu. Now, alone, this was pretty bad, but there was something incredibly frustrating that this Lakitu caused. At a certain part of the level, the Lakitu and his spinies caused the sprites to overload, making it possible for a necessary spring to not load in. This ended up happening to me multiple times, and frankly, it was probably the single most frustrating thing in the entire game. Finally, after killing the Lakitu at just the right points, I got the spring to spawn in, however, I got hit by a new Lakitu when I tried to jump on it. What a bummer. It was super scary, but on my next attempt, I finally beat it. Unfortunately, I've still got a castle level to get through. There's a pretty infamous obstacle in this one too, where you need to make it through a dip with the fire bar going the opposite way as you. There's other spots in the game previously like this, but they all had areas you could hide in. It's a super tight maneuver, but thankfully I pulled it off on my first try. After a big leap over Bowser, I finally managed to beat World C. Phew. Next up was the last world, World D. World D was not free, but at least there was nothing as bad as C3. In D2, I found a section where a couple of secrets actually allowed me to farm infinite power-ups, making it pretty easy to get a fire flower here. 
D2 had a pretty miserable section right before the flag though, where you had to use a spring to land on a single tile block. Unfortunately, I did not get this on my first try. Or the second. Or the third. I did get it eventually though, but I soon got a game over to a hammer bro in D3. Okay, that might just be the worst hitbox I've seen yet. D3 is covered with hammer bros and cannons, but thankfully I got through it on the next try. Time for the last level. This castle starts off with some tricky platforming when suddenly you enter a pipe and end up back in the overworld. Don't be fooled though, this is the hardest part. There's an evil hammer bro here, and he got me three times in a row, bringing me down to just one life. I finally got past him, but it wasn't over yet. After another blind jump and a random underground section, you're back in the castle. I snuck below another blue Bowser here, and I found another hammer bro in a pretty tight corridor. Yikes. It was incredibly close, but somehow I managed to get past him. Come on, I'm so close. The final Bowser has a low ceiling with a fire bar, but with some correct timing, I managed to run below him and finish World D. Finally, Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels had been defeated. Well, not quite. After quite a bit of time away from the game, I decided that I wanted to do World 9 after all. That's right, I beat the whole game again without warps. This time though, I finally played through the whole game as Mario. Man, it was kinda nice not being so slippery, although there were definitely a few parts where I missed the higher jumps. I was a bit rusty at the game by this point too, so it took me another hour and 40 minutes to finally beat the game again. I really wanted to beat Bowser with a fire flower to see if it carried over to World 9, but I got totally ripped off during the final Bowser fight. Apparently there was so much going on at the time that Bowser's fireball decided to just not be visible until it hit me. Wow, that's total baloney. Alright though, time for World 9 once again. Remember, if I fail this, I have to go all the way back to the start of the game. I had lost my save state at this point too, so all I could do was watch my previous footage to make sure I remembered where everything was. This time, I made it through 9-2 without failing, so I just had the last two levels left. In 9-3, I snuck over Bowser and even jumped over the flagpole by mistake. Okay, just one more level left. I can do this. This level isn't all that bad, other than that one blooper. After almost getting sniped by a hammer bow, I was at the part with the blooper. With some careful positioning, I got past him. Phew. The rest was a breeze and World 9 was finally complete. Wow, after almost 10 hours, I was finally done. What a brutal game. With that, Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels was now truly complete. On to the review. Man, I have some mixed feelings about this one. First off, I want to make something clear. I like hard games, as long as I actually enjoy the gameplay. In fact, I would even say I find modern Mario games to be more easy than I would prefer, and I personally would be happy to see another hard Mario game like this. Because of this, for the most part, I actually like the difficulty of this game too, other than maybe a few levels here and there. When it comes to a lot of the pure platforming challenges, I think some of the best stages in this game surpass the original. The only aspect of the difficulty I don't really like is that I feel like the game gives you too few lives. Now, I don't even mind having a life system, and I think resetting at the start of a world is a decent setback point that I don't get frustrated at. However, considering the overall difficulty of the game, I just think I would have liked a bit more with perhaps 5 lives instead of just 3. My biggest issue with the game though is not the difficulty, and more with the unlock requirements for the post game, especially worlds A through D. Having to beat the game 8 times to see the rest of the levels is kind of just ridiculous. World 9 isn't much better, as the combination of requiring you to beat the game without warps and beating it without dying was kind of just annoying. I think getting rid of even just one of these two aspects of World 9 would have made it much better. Now, I know this is all technically post-game content, but I personally think side content is just as important to my enjoyment of the game as the main content, so I don't think it's immune to criticism. Ultimately, nothing about a game is required in the sense that you can just put the controller down at any point. I play games to play games, not just to see the credits, so I think all the content in a game deserves to be judged relatively equally regardless of whether or not it is required to see the ending. It just doesn't matter how you slice it. Needing to play the game 8 times over to see 30% of the levels is nothing short of tedious. The final issue I have with the game is that some of the more janky elements were pretty frustrating here, such as the spring despawning, bad hitboxes, and Bowser's fire disappearing entirely. Now, I know many of these issues were present in the original Super Mario Bros, but I found I ran into them more often here, and they were even more frustrating in this one due to the game's overall difficulty increase. Ultimately, when I compare this to the original Super Mario Bros, I want to like it more. It has higher highs, and overall I even like the difficulty. Unfortunately, it just has too many problems that push it back for me, such as a harsh life count, issues with jank, and its absurd post-game requirements. In the end, I gave the game a 7 out of 10. Thanks for watching the video. If you want to see more of these in the future, make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you won't miss out on the next one. Also leave a like if you enjoyed it, since it will help the channel grow and motivate me to continue this series. I hope I will see you in the next step of my quest to beat every Nintendo game.